Now let us unite our hearts in prayer. Oh God, you have created everything that is. You made the earth on which we stand and live and that offers all of the provision that we need. You made the heavens that stretch so far above us that they remind us of just how small we really are in the big picture. You made the light that brightens up our lives and especially, we are reminded today, warms up our cold hearts. And yet, God, even as you made all of these things and called them good, you still found room to make us, forming every one of us in your very image. Oh God, as we remember the baptism of Jesus today, awaken us to the memory of our own baptism. Keep us ever aware of our identity, not just as part of your creation, but as your very beloved children. Awaken us also to the fact that those people around us are your children too, and to treat them with the love and respect that is due them because of who they are in you. God, open our hearts to the truth that by our baptism we are not merely your children. More than that, we are called by our baptism to be in ministry in your church and in your world. And so enliven again our passions for serving you and and for caring for one another in love. Help us to discern those opportunities to show love and to reach out and to extend kindness and to imitate your Son, Jesus Christ, in all that we do, so that we all may indeed be in ministry. O oh God, the waters of our baptism also remind us of your cleansing power. And so once again, wash us clean. Purge us of the attitudes, the harsh words, the short-sightedness that distract us from humbly serving you. We ask that you would wash us from the tendency to waste our breath and our time and our energy and our gifts on things that simply do not matter. Cleanse us from the desire to build our own kingdom rather than yours and to follow our own will rather than yours. O oh God, we are indeed your beloved children, created in your image and called to be active participants in your ministry. And so continue to mold us into the people you would have us be, especially now as we pray as your son Jesus taught us to pray long ago, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. gospel which comes this morning from Mark chapter 1. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locust and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. Friends, this is the Word of God for all of us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. I am the 
thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice, and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me precious bleeding side. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and thy will be lost in thine. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee all the follies of sin I resign. My Speak through me, or speak in spite of me. But speak, Lord, for we, your children, long to hear a word from you. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I'm going to describe a scene for you, and I want you just to think back and and, and think if you have ever seen this before in church. There are young parents standing at the front of the church during worship, holding in their arms a precious small child who is perhaps peacefully asleep. The baby is dressed in some of the whitest, cleanest baptismal garments that a child could wear because the parents were wise enough to know to wait until five minutes before the service started to get them dressed up in it. The preacher reaches into the baptismal font and and gets some water and then gently places it on that child's head. That water then gently trickles down the child's face and the congregation 
that's gathered around sings lovingly about how that child is a child of God, part of God's family. The preacher concludes this little ritual by praying that God would strengthen this baptized child by the power of the Holy Spirit, that they may live in grace and peace. And upon the completion of this nice ritual, the smiling parents and their child return to their seats, and the rest of the worship service returns to what was already in progress before it was interrupted by this sweet little ritual. At the end of the service, everyone, uh, or a few family members might stick around and take some pictures at the front of the church. But for the most part, everyone who was gathered for worship, the preacher included, leaves and returns to their normal lives, and it's almost as though nothing at all happened. You ever been part of that? Some of us have been the smiling young parents at the front of the church. But it's easy to watch what unfolds in a baptism and to think, ah, oh, that was really nice. And then we go about our lives, many of us probably as though nothing happened at all. And if we've ever walked away from that scene as though nothing had happened, then we could probably learn a thing or two from the story of Jesus' baptism, another event that has led many over the years to wonder what exactly happened. You see, Christians throughout the centuries have had some really good questions about Jesus' baptism. For example, if Jesus was without sin, then why did he participate in a ritual that often we associate with the forgiveness of sins? If he was so clearly already God's child, then why did he participate in a ritual where we, among other things, are claimed as part of God's family? There are some really good questions about what on earth happened, and thankfully for me, and probably thankfully for you, I'm not going to attempt to answer those right now. But it's easy to look at that story and to wonder, all right, what's the big deal? Even the ways that we hear the story of Jesus' baptism perhaps tame it down to an extent uh, that we miss the significance of what's going on. You know, Mark has this beautiful scene of Jesus rising up out of the, the beautiful, peaceful waters of the Jordan River. And then as, as he comes up, he sees this, this beautiful dove coming down peacefully, gliding and, 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 and resting on him. Except for a few minor details, Mark never says that the waters or the Holy Spirit are peaceful or are beautiful or are sweet. For those who were around here uh, in October of 2015 or 2016, uh, you know that water is not always peaceful, is it? Water can actually be quite dangerous and it can change the direction of our lives. I remember in October of 2015, my wife Marissa and I were expecting our second child pretty much at any moment when the floods came. And I remember praying that our, our child would not come before the floodwaters subsided because there was a while where we could not get in or out of our neighborhood uh, to go to a hospital. I remember thinking that I might have to look up YouTube videos on how to deliver a child, which would not have probably gone very well. But on a more serious note, there are people in our church and even in our community over those two Octobers who were temporarily displaced from their homes. Some even lost their homes. Even just this past week, we're reminded that just a little bit of water, if it freezes in the right spot on the road, can make cars that weigh several thousand pounds go sliding all over the place without any control. Water can actually be dangerous, and it can lead to significant changes in our lives. Uh, and, and what about doves? Um, they aren't always peaceful and gentle and sweet, are they? I remember a few years ago, I was driving down the, the road on a beautiful day. It was probably about 80 degrees warmer than it is today. Um, and it was beautiful. I had my car windows rolled down. I had my music blaring louder than it probably should have, singing along at the top of my lungs. And up ahead, as I ran into the corner, I could see there was a bird kind of over by the side of the road. Um, a little distance ahead, and I didn't really think much of it. I even remember looking and thinking, oh, look, a sweet little bird. But then as I neared the point in the road where the bird was, it suddenly lifted up its head, lifted up off the ground. I think it about doubled or maybe even tripled in size, and it began to fly into my open passenger side window. Being the reasonable person that I am, I assume that this bird understood English just like every other animal. 
And so I began shouting instructions to that bird, but it didn't listen. Hmm. In a final attempt to avoid a catastrophic encounter with this new feathered friend, I quickly rolled up my window and swerved out of the way of it. Not only was that bird not peace, not peaceful and sweet and beautiful, but that bird actually led me to change the direction I was going. Water is not always gentle. It has the power to ferociously interrupt our lives. Doves are not always gentle. They can fly, while they can fly beautifully and gracefully, they also have been known to dive bomb into people's lives unexpectedly. And friends, the same is true for the Holy Spirit in our lives. Just as God began to create all of creation long ago, it was the Spirit that swept over the chaos and the darkness that existed. And the chaos and the darkness were never again the same, were they? Following Jesus' baptism, it was the Spirit that drove Jesus into the wilderness where he was tempted after not eating or drinking anything for 40 days and nights. It was the Spirit that rested on Jesus as he preached his first sermon, a sermon which, by the way, so troubled the people who heard it, that afterwards they attempted to throw him off of a cliff. I'm reminded by that story that sometimes when somebody says, I didn't like your sermon, that can be a compliment, because it might mean that we're preaching like Jesus. And as Jesus began his ministry, a ministry that was unconventional, that would involve great pain and suffering and sacrifice, and that would ultimately lead to death on a cross, this very same spirit came upon him, ferociously interrupting any illusions that people around him had of what his life would be like. Even in the life of Jesus Christ, the Son of God who had no sin, the Holy Spirit did not bring peace and serenity, did it? Rather, it drove him out into the world where there was kingdom work to be done, regardless of what pain and difficulty came along with that work. And friends, if it did that to Jesus, if it drove him to the wilderness, if it drove him to pain and suffering, then who are we to think that the Spirit of God would call us to anything less? One writer has put it this way. He said, Jesus did not receive the Spirit in order to enjoy privately its spiritual benefits, but rather in order to pass it on. If our baptism involves a participation in Jesus' baptism, And if Jesus' baptism initiates his ministry of suffering obedience, then our baptism must include similar acceptance of self-denial. Another writer puts it even more directly. Our, Our baptism ritual, sometimes so nice that we neglect to mention the uncomfortable implications of inviting God's Spirit to invade our lives. And notice he didn't say, for God's Spirit to come peacefully like a dove, into our lives, but to invade our lives, to perhaps change our course. When the Spirit invades our lives like a dove invading a moving vehicle, it can be uncomfortable, just like it was for me that day. Take, for instance, the example of a young man who went one late May evening to church, and, and, and like uh, many people in the past, he, he, in his words, he said he went to church unwillingly, In his faith journey, he seems to have been experiencing some spiritual burnout. He'd just been on this missionary expedition that, on all accounts, was a failure, a massive failure. But then something happened at that worship service that he unwillingly attended. He says, About a quarter before nine, while someone was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for my salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Those words come from John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement. Uh, It's known as his, that encounter with the Holy Spirit is known as his Aldersgate experience. And it's an experience that changed things in his life. While he had already started this Methodist movement, this reform movement within the Church of England before that night, something nevertheless changed. After all, if something can warm up somebody's heart, it also can possibly set the world on fire in a positive way. 
Wesley had already traveled from England to the American colonies to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. But what he did after that heartwarming experience by the fire of the Holy Spirit was even more remarkable. Every year for the rest of his life, it's believed that he traveled 4,500 miles a year to preach, which is pretty incredible given the fact that he didn't have a car. He had to go on a horse. He preached two to four times every day, which means that it's estimated that in those last 52 years of his life, he preached more than 40,000 sermons. That's a lot. (laughs) With slavery a reality in his very own backyard, he became a dedicated abolitionist. He developed the first Sunday schools and worked to combat uh, poverty and, and, and all kinds of social ills that plagued the people of his day. When he died, having to devoted all of those final years of his life to that important work that the Spirit had given to him to do, he did so, I'm told, with hardly a penny to his name. Today, the United Methodist Church, which we're a part of and which grew out of the Methodist movement that John Wesley began several hundred years ago, is made up of more than 12 and a half million people worldwide. And it's estimated that the membership in all of the different churches and denominations that trace their start back to John Wesley is tens of millions more than that. In Wesley's life, the Holy Spirit did not merely come to bring peace. It came to disrupt and interrupt and and to move and to shake, and thank God that it did because that movement of the Holy Spirit in his life has impacted every one of our lives today. There are plenty of other people who who we can look at and say that the, the Holy Spirit in their life disrupted them and and, and made them a little uncomfortable but changed the world for the better. One of those people is a woman named Dorothy Day in in Rock Hill where I grew up at one of the Catholic churches. They had a soup kitchen that was called the Dorothy Day Soup Kitchen. And I for years had no idea who Dorothy Day was. Uh, But it turns out about two weeks ago was the 90th anniversary of her baptism into the Catholic church. And up to that point in her life, she had variously been non-religious, religious, had even been an atheist at one point. Uh, She'd had multiple failed marriages uh, to to men who were not the best to her. Um, Her third and final marriage actually fell apart when she uh, decided to have their child baptized into the church, and her husband didn't want anything to do with the church. He was very much against the church, and so he left because he didn't want to be married to someone who would baptize their child in the church. And in fact, Dorothy would go on to be baptized herself. And in the Christ she discovered through that, um, she became very dedicated to issues of poverty and justice and, um, and realized that it was God she'd been seeking her whole life, looking to support people who were struggling with poverty and, 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 and injustices. She worked to launch what was known as the Catholic Workers' Movement. Uh, with her help, there were more than 30 worker houses that were started in the United States and Canada, England, Australia, and Mexico that offered food and shelter to anyone in need, regardless of whether they deserved it or not. In a world where so many of us desire upward mobility, the, the, the ability to, to increase our, our possessions and increase our means and increase our social status, she actually led many people to practice voluntary poverty or what we might call downward mobility. When the Holy Spirit interrupted her life, it changed her life dramatically, and it opened her up to criticism from a lot of people. I believe at one point, um, because of um, her outreach to the poor and because of how she was organizing people, the FBI actually investigated her to figure out what was up. The Holy Spirit did not make her life any easier. In fact, it probably made it harder. But it wasn't about making it easier that was important. It changed her life and the lives of countless others for the better. The great Christian thinker and and writer C.S. Lewis was very well aware of how sometimes we want to perhaps uh, domesticate the Holy Spirit and to treat it as though it's this kind of light thing out there that's pretty much detached from our lives. But he said that for Christians, the Spirit is not lighter than matter, but heavier. It moves people to abandon the comfort zone of of home and to travel thousands of miles on horseback, preaching the gospel to people they'd never met before, and to die with nothing more than a few dollars in their pockets. The Holy Spirit moves people to feed and to give shelter and to subject themselves to criticism by others. It even moves people to confront the wilderness face to face 
and to die on a cross as Jesus did. The question is not whether the Holy Spirit moves us to places like those, but rather whether or not we're willing to let it do that. In a moment, we're going to do something together that's a little bit different from what we would normally do. We are going to reaffirm our baptismal covenant together as a congregation. Uh, We are going to recommit ourselves to the things that we promised to do when we are baptized or, or, or to the things that maybe were promised on our behalf if we were baptized when we were a tiny child. And after doing that, if you feel so led, I'm going to invite you during the last hymn to come forward to the baptismal font and to just touch the water and if you want to make a cross on your forehead or, or, or whatever you want to do to remember your baptism. What we're doing is not baptism. We're simply remembering our baptism. But while the, while the Spirit of, of God might not be calling us to start new Christian movements that have tens of millions of followers or to devote our lives to starting dozens of shelters for people who are poor, we remember that the Spirit has called people to do far crazier things than that. At the very least, here are some of the radical things that God's Spirit calls us to do. In a world where sin and evil and wickedness are so real, the Spirit calls us to renounce and reject those things. We are called to resist evil and injustice and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. In a world where it's often, we're often taught that it's good to be self-reliant and where we worship plenty of things and people as our Lord, the Spirit calls us instead to put our whole trust in Jesus Christ, to serve him alone as our Lord, and to actually serve as Christ represented us out there in the world. In other words, the Holy Spirit calls us to be people who when we go out there, people look at us and feel as though they have seen Christ. That's a high calling. Before you come up, remember that the water with which you were once baptized at some point probably flooded. (laughs) It probably poured down from the sky. It probably tossed around violently in the ocean. It probably at some point was frozen and maybe redirected a vehicle. The same spirit that claimed you as God's child then has also helped to turn chaos into darkness and all of creation. That very same spirit that, that... claimed you at your baptism, also drove Jesus into the wilderness. It almost got Jesus thrown off of a cliff after his first sermon, and ultimately it led him to the cross. Whether the Spirit has descended on you peacefully like a dove, or it has come crashing in through a window of your car that you didn't know was open, leading you to swerve in a direction that you never dreamed of going, it has not come to leave you the same as you are. It has come to transform every single one of us and to transform the world around us. Will you let it? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.